we'll begin with one very common idea that's built into our common sense, which is that the world, the physical world, consists of two aspects, respectively form and matter. This was foisted on us by Aristotle and also by the Bible because it is said that God created man out of the dust of the earth and as it were made a figurine in his own image and then breathed the breath of life into its nostrils so that this form of clay became a living being. And so underneath that lies the notion that everything material is made of some sort of basic stuff like clay is the basis of pots. And for centuries, scientists, philosophers wanted to know what is that stuff? What are we made of? Now look here, a carpenter makes tables out of wood and a potter makes pots out of clay. But I ask you, is a tree made of wood? Obviously not. A tree is wood. It's not made of it. Is a mountain made of rock? Obviously not. It is rock. See, our language contains innumerable ghosts. Supposing I say, the lightning flashes. Surely the flashing is the same as the lightning. There is not one thing called lightning and another called flashing. The lightning is the flashing. It is raining. What is this it that is raining? The raining. I can make a noun out of a verb any time by turning it into a gerund. So we populate the world with ghosts, which arise out of the structure of our language, and thus, therefore, of the structure of our thinking, because we think in language or in figuring in numbers. And so it's of intensely fascinating investigation to find out what are the hidden assumptions that underlie language and figuring. In other words, language and mathematics. And here is this basic assumption, you see, that is almost with us all. It comes again and again into our everyday speech that form, pattern, organization, organisms are made of something. As if there were some inert, primordial, and of course stupid stuff which had to be put into shape by an energy and an intelligence other than the stuff. Like the intelligence of the potter shapes the clay. So therefore, we have a basic picture of the world in which everything is being pushed around. There's a boss. There's somebody in charge who is different from what that somebody is in charge of and puts everything into shape because our common sense does not allow that things shape themselves. Very odd. In Chinese, the word for nature is ziran, which is that which is so of itself, the spontaneous. The Chinese have no difficulty in thinking about nature as self-shaping. A Chinese child would not ask its mother, how was I made? It would ask its mother, how did I grow? Which would be quite different. So to be made is to be commanded. And therefore every good being obeys. Whether you obey God or whether you obey the laws of nature, you obey. And the an analog, therefore, of the world that has been put into our common sense is one of military command. Note that. 
because the image of God, I would go further and say the idolatrous image of God, which has been handed down to us, is one of the beneficent tyrant, the boss. Big Papa. So then, when our physicists started to find out what stuff was, they went into it and into it and examined it with ever more minute instruments. They first started cutting up things with knives and cutting them smaller and smaller and smaller until the particle that they wanted to dissect was exactly the same width as the edge of the knife. And so they got an atom. And that word in Greek, atomos, means the non-cuttable. A non-tomos cuttable. That's the basic atom. What you can't cut anymore, because you got down to the end. Well, they weren't satisfied with that. So they got an atomos, in other words, a particle of something or other that was just the same width as the blade of the, the, edge, the knife edge, and they looked at it under a microscope. And they saw that it was, seemed to be composed of more small particles. So they found out means of working those out, and then they found out extraordinary means of uh, investigating the properties of matter. Then they reached a point where they couldn't decide whether it was particles or whether it was waves. So they called them wavicles. They thought they had come to certain ultimate wavicles called electrons. But then, unfortunately, everything fall, fell apart and they found protons, mesons, and many other uh, extraordinary things. Because, of course, what they didn't realize was that as you make more and more powerful microscopic instruments, the universe has to get smaller and smaller in order to escape the investigation. Just as when the telescopes become more and more powerful, the galaxies have to recede in order to get away from the telescopes. Because what is happening in all these investigations is through us and through our eyes and senses, the universe is looking at itself. And when you try to turn around to see your own head, what happens? See? It runs away. You never get at it. You can't bite your own teeth. You can't touch the tip of this finger with the tip of this finger. This is the principle. Shankara explains it beautifully in his commentary on the Kena Upanishad, where he says that that which is the knower, the ground of all knowledge, is never itself an object of knowledge, just as fire doesn't burn itself. So there's always that profound mystery that you are never going to be in absolute control of what goes on because if you were to be like making love to a plastic woman and who wants that there always is the mystery uh -uh. The thing we don't know, as Van der Leeuw put it, the mystery of life is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. If there were not that, you see, there would be no life. The reason why certain people turn to philosophy, why I became a philosopher, was that since I was a little boy, I always felt that existence as such was weird. I mean, here we are. Isn't that odd? Of course it's odd. What do you mean, what do you mean by odd? Well, that's what's different from evil. I mean, what's odd stands out. What's even lies flat. But you can't see the outstanding without the flat background. You see? 
is the thing standing out. It's odd. Each one of you is odd. Strange, unique, particular, different. How do we know what we mean by that? Except against the background of something even that is not differentiated, like space. And so you get this philosophical itch. You begin to scratch your head and think about why is that so? Well, after a while, you realize that's a meaningless question. Then you ask, how is it so? Well, that leads you into science and other investigations. So you want to know, what is it? I mean, this, this happening, this thing called existence, what is it? You ask that question long enough and it suddenly hits you that if you could answer it, you wouldn't know what terms to put the answer in. I mean, when we investigate the properties of nature, and we do get some answers, all the answers are in terms of particular structures, forms, patterns. And these can be measured, and their behavior can be predicted. But when I want to ask the question, what are the forms made of? I mean, what is it really? We can't think of any way in which we could answer the question. Because we would have to have a class of all classes. When you ask the question, what? It's like saying, is you is or is you ain't? Is you animal? Is you vegetable? Is you mineral? Are you a Republican or a Democrat? Are you male or female? Are you a Christian or a Jew or a Hindu or what have you? We classify always to give an answer to the question, what is it? And when you classify, you distinguish an inside group from an outside group. Right. So what we want to know is what is the group of all groups? Well, we can't imagine what the outside would be. So we can't answer the question. What is it? So the physicists finally abandoned the quest for stuff. And they gave us a description of the universe entirely in terms of form. The pattern, not the stuff. When people ask, what's the what? Yeah, but you can't do that. What's the pattern made of? Surely it mustn't be an answer to that. See, what happens is, when you turn up the microscope, all stuff turns into form. It becomes articulate. You know, the carpet uh, looks like some sort of stuff. But when you look at it under a microscope, you will see the crystalline structure of the nylon or whatever it's made of. See? They want to know what are those crystals made of. All right? Turn up the volume. And you'll find... Uh, molecules. Turn up the volume. You find wavicles. But, but the, 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 the wavicles must be of something. But of course they're not. We find the substance or stuff totally vanishes. And we're left with form. Sanskrit doesn't really have a word for matter. It has nama rupa which means named form. It's the form that matters. Or let's put it in another way, everything is a matter of form. <laughs> now let's go into this, it's fascinating. They say, does it matter? What does that mean? Does it matter? Is it important? In other words, does it measure up to anything? All right, let's go back to the Indo-European roots of the language. Matter comes from a Sanskrit root, matra, which means to measure. 
lay out the foundations, say, for a building. So from this root matra, we get going on into Sanskrit, we get the word maya. And maya is generally translated illusion, although it also means magic, creative power. The word illusion, switch over, we get that from Latin. And that comes from the Latin ludere, to play. Let's pretend that we matter. <laughs> and so, also from the root matra, see, you get meter. That is also to measure. You get metir in Greek, mater in Latin, which means mama, mother. The mother of Buddha was called Maya. Mary, Ma, again, is the mother of Jesus. Ma, 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 Ma. But Ma, you see, is a matter of form. Pattern. The Chinese called the basic principle of nature, Li. And the character for Li means the markings in jade, the fiber and muscle, the grain in wood. So Joseph Needham translates it organic pattern. And that's what's going on. And there isn't any stuff involved. What stuff is? is a pattern seen out of focus where it becomes fuzzy like kapok see we say kapok is the stuffing of a cushion and that's stuff it's you know some kind of goop but when we examine the kapok closely we find structure and that's what you will find and there never will be anything else crazy because it completely flouts our common sense we say but surely when philosophers beat tables that are in front of them and you know they say it is there because bang you know there must be something that is stuff that is substantial but the only reason why you can't pass your hand through a table is the table's moving too fast <laughs> it's like trying to put your finger through an electric fan only it's going much faster than an electric fan anything solid is going so fast that there's no way to get this through it that's all so you say what is it that is going so fast well that question is based on a, a grammatical illusion the grammatical illusion is that all verbs have to have subjects. Can you imagine anything more weird than the idea that a verb or an action or event must be set into motion by a noun? That is to say, a non-event or thing. Now, what's the difference between a thing and an event? I can't for the life of me tell. We say, this is a fist. <coughs> That's a noun. What happens to it when I open my hand? This thing has unaccountably disappeared. So I should have called this a fisting. And this is a handing. It may also be a pointing. So we, we, we could devise a language such as that of the Nootka Indians, where there are no nouns, there are only verbs. Chinese is very close to that. I think the superimposition of the idea of noun and verb on the Chinese language is a Western invention. I can't think of any Chinese word for a noun. But the, all those 
Languages of Indo-European origin have nouns and verbs in them. They have agents and operations. And that's one of the basic snags. When we divide the world into operations and agents, doers and doings, then we ask such silly questions as, who knows? Who does it? What does it? When the what that is supposed to do it is the same as the doing. And you can very easily see that the whole process of the universe may be understood as process. Nobody's doing it. Because when you go back to doing it, you go back to the military analogy, the chain of command. <coughs> the bus who goes bang and the object obeys. It's a very crude idea. Very unsophisticated. So, if you can bear it, we have suddenly eliminated a spook. And the spook was called stuff. So we are now more at ease with ourselves in a world of form, Namarupa. Named forms. Boy, we can, of course, get rid of the names. We can uh, go further and try the experiment of not calling the forms by any names. We're just observing the forms, although when we've got rid of the names, we can't even call them forms. Because that's a name. And there's the, the, the bazaars going on which uh, Buddhists call tathata. And that means suchness, or thusness. Actually, tathata is da da da. Because when a baby first talks, it says da. Da, 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 da. And fathers flatter themselves that it's saying da da. It isn't. It's saying da. And so the Upanishads say da dvamasi. You're it. <laughs> the basic da. But da doesn't mean anything. Da is like everything else. See, the world is a musical phenomenon. Good music never refers to anything except the music itself. You don't ask Mr. Bach, Mr. Ravi Shankar, what do you mean by this music? What is it intended to express? Bad music always expresses something other than itself, like the 1812 Overture or the Sunken Cathedral. Good music never talks about anything other than the music. If you ask Bach, what is your meaning? He say, listen. That's the meaning. Giraffes are giraffing, trees are treeing, stars are starring, clouds are clouding, rain is raining. And if you don't understand, look at it again. <laughs> and people are peopling.